All right, so this is our third topic for the unit. Um, and this lecture is not going to cover all of growth. Um, the next topic, we're going to um, cover some aspects of growth along with control. Because as you guys will realize, too, what we know about growth, we use against microorganisms to control their growth, right, or kill them. So growth in general, right, we need to be able to list the 10 elements that microbes require in large amounts, so commonly referred to as macro nutrients or macro elements. And the six elements that they require in trace amounts, micro or trace elements. So not only do we need to be able to list them and classify them as macro or, mi or, or um, micro, We need to be identify in what capacities these elements are used to build cellular macromolecules. So what ones are in proteins? What ones are in carbohydrates? What's in nucleic acids? What's in lipids? So let's first start out with a very simple molecule that most of you guys know of the elements it's made up of. What is water? H2O. What does the H stand for? Hydrogen. What does the O stand for? Oxygen. What are those? Elements, right? So yeah, chemistry a little bit, I know, but it's important because we're all made of these things, including bacteria. So guess what? A lot of this stuff we're going to talk about is the same for us. It's not all that different, which makes it pretty easy because, you know, we're kind of specialists usually when it comes to us, I at least hope, right? So we're made out of proteins in carbohydrates and nucleic acids and lipids, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so are they, right? So it's the same story, just some variations. So we already mentioned hydrogen and oxygen, but what's number one before that, especially when you talk about organic molecules? What's the backbone for all those Carbon. molecules? Carbon. So we've got carbon, we've got oxygen, we've got hydrogen. What's N? Nitrogen, S, sulfur, P, phosphorus, K, potassium, Ca, calcium, Mg, magnesium, Fe, iron. Notice that the first six are highlighted. That's because the, those are the ones that are used to build our macromolecules, right? Those are the ones in, car, in um, carbohydrates and proteins, and nucleic acids, and lipids. The others are needed in larger concentrations, but those of you guys taking anatomy and physiology, these usually are involved in cellular processes, right? So remember, like the movement of calcium ions for the movement of what? Uh, don't make me have to use anatomy terms. Huh? So calcium, it moves, right, from one area in the cell with the saco, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, so what's, what eventually moves your muscle cells, right? Right, so calcium ions actually positively charge calcium, right? Magnesium is really important, again, uh, for certain uh, cellular processes. Iron is a major component of what very important protein that helps carry stuff for us. Hemoglobin, right, for carrying oxygen. So we need these in pretty large quantities. Um, potassium as well, right? If you don't have the levels right, you don't get stuff moving across membranes. You don't get ionic balance like you need to have for, for maintaining homeostasis in the body. So these similar type things happen for bacterial cells too, right? Iron is important for their metabolism. A little bit different than what we've got going on, but still important, right? Um, they need it for their cytochromes and their electron transport chain, right? Um, and, and we need it in ours, too, but we always really focus on that whole having to get oxygen around the body thing, right? That's the major draw for iron, but iron's used for other things. So these guys are, are needed in pretty large quantities because they do a lot of jobs. But the first six are definitely needed in extremely large quantities because they make up the molecular structure of our macromolecules, of our proteins, of our carbohydrates, our nucleic acids, our lipids. 
So we need lots of them, hence why they're called macro elements, right? Macro meaning large. Our micronutrients, the ones that are needed in trace amounts and small amounts, and in this list, you need to be, identify, be able to identify the element that is required for nitrogen fixation. Now, this is something only some microbes can do. We certainly do not do this. So what's MN? Manganese. Yeah, manganese. ZN? Zinc. Zinc. CO? Cobalt, MO, probably none of you have ever heard of it, right? Molly <laughs> Binamon. And um, this element um, is definitely needed for uh, nitrogen fixation um, in microbes that can do nitrogen fixation. And we've actually found that it must have um, some properties, some, some need in humans as well um, because they've started including it in multivitamins but the, I don't think they've really locked down like what we're using this element for like what what metabolic processes do we need it for what's NI nickel CU copper right so these are things that tend to be can be used over and over again they're usually cofactors for um, enzymes that catalyze reactions that can be used over and over again so they don't need a lot of them but they need enough to be able to get these processes going so again they're micro or trace elements and usually um, these will be found in the water supply or they'll be supplemented in the media that we feed our bacteria. Right? There's a lot of minerals in our water right? that come from the environment, from rocks and such as that. And, and in fact, you would not want to drink pure water. It does not taste good. That would um, probably destroy cells. Yeah. And it's actually the mineral content that makes it palatable for us um, and evolutionary wise it probably makes sense and that and pure water can only be produced in a lab it doesn't exist in nature right pure h2o and nothing else no other elements so there's more that we than we get from from water than just water right you get a lot of uh, minerals trace minerals that you need So the general form for carbohydrates, or commonly sometimes referred to as sugars, or saccharides, monosaccharides meaning a single sugar, di, to, right, polysaccharides, many sugars hooked together. The general form formula is a carbon in a water molecule, hence why they're called carbon, carb carbohydrates they're carbon and water so notice that for this um, six carbon sugar right remember water is H2O so 2 times 6 is 12 1 times 6 is still 6 so this is why right they're called carbohydrates they're basically carbon atoms with a water at, uh, molecule A lot of times they form these cyclic structures, right, where the carbons form a circle and you have the oxygens and the hydrogens attached to that. So here's good old glucose, right? Glucose can, is a main source of energy for organisms that use chemical forms of energy, right? They'll break down this molecule and utilize the energy stored in the bonds. Other common monosaccharides, single sugars that we're exposed to, are things like galactose and fructose. Fructose, of course, is found in fruits and plant plants. Um, sucrose, which is also found in, in plants, right, in the sugarcane plant, is a disaccharide. It is fructose and glucose hooked together. Right? We very simply just break apart that bond, and then we have two rich sugars. 
Lactose is another disaccharide, which is why some people can't digest it because they can't break apart the two sugars. And I want to say it's glucose and galactose, but don't quote me on it. <laughs> right? Um, cellulose, the, what makes up the cell wall of plants, is just glucose hooked together in a polymer. Right? Lots of glucoses. The problem with that for us is, again, we don't have the enzymes to break apart the glucose in the configuration it is in. What's the storage form of glucose for us in our body? What's the polymer that we make out of glucose? Glycogen. Again, it's just a whole bunch of glucoses hooked together in a particular way, right? Um, what's the storage form of glucose for most plants? I'm talking about storing it for themselves, not making up their cell wall. Starch. Starch. We can digest that, though, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have enzymes to digest starch. Things like amylase, right? Those types of enzymes. Right. We can break it apart. So we see definitely the, the and again in this drawing, the, the hydrogen and the oxygen. But at each one of these points, there would also be a carbon, as well as the carbon represented here. And as I said, for each molecule of carbon, you usually have a water molecule, an H2O. So for sugars, they're made up of what? Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Carbon and water. And so there's a hydrogen at every corner? No, co uh, carbon. Carbon. Because the formula here, here, right, is six carbons, right, 12 hydrogens and, and 12 oxygens, but this is written in a simplistic form where each one of these points here is a carbon. So if you were to count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 carbons. This, this point actually has an oxygen. Do you see how the oxygen is drawn there? And then you would count 6 um, oxygens as well. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then if you count all the hydrogens, there should be 12. I don't feel like counting to 12. <laughs> All right. So the next, does anybody know what's in this box up here and these two boxes down here? So glycine, alanine, phenylalanine, <coughs> tryptophan, amino acids, amino acids. How many are there naturally occurring? 20, 20. And they all have a similar general formula, right? They're all made of an amino group. So in this group, we have hydrogen and nitrogen. And then they have what's called the carboxyl group, and that is carbon and oxygen. So all of them have carbon is the backbone, right? It's the main element that bonds everything together. And then they also have hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen. So just like sugars, right, we start out with carbon and we add water, and we have one more element here, nitrogen. Now what makes each amino acid different from one another is its side group that it has here. And so two of these, shown here, have one additional element in their side groups. Methionine has it, and cytosine has it. Do you guys see what the additional letter is there? Sulfur. Sulfur. <laughs> right? Proteins contain sulfur as well. if they have the amino acids, methionine, and cytosine in them. And definitely for, because remember from genetics at the very beginning, that start codon actually codes for an amino acid. you guys remember which amino acid? Methionine. Most bacteria, their proteins contain methionine as their first amino acid. So they all contain sulfur in their proteins. Yeah. 
we on the other hand modify our DNA, right? So, I mean, modify our messenger RNA and our proteins. Where bacteria are pretty simplistic, like pretty much what it says is what they do, and that's it. For the most part. So here we have DNA, which is a nucleic acid, right? That's what the NA stands for, for nucleic acid. So the S here represents sugar, right? So we already know what sugar is made out of. In the case of DNA, it's a ribose sugar, so five carbon sugar. And deoxy, meaning it's missing an oxygen that the normal ribose sugar would have. <coughs> but we already know what sugars are made out of, right? What are they made out of? Carbon hydrogen and oxygen, carbon and water. So right there again we're starting out with carbon. The A's, the G's, the T's and C's, the name that they're given is bases but sometimes a little bit more um, specific name as a nitrogenous base. So guess what elements other than carbon, hydrogen and oxygen do you think they have associated with them? Nitrogen. But they have one additional element that, car that carbohydrates and amino acids, which make up proteins, don't have. They have the P, right, which is phosphorus, which makes up the phosphate groups, right, that join the sugars together that create what we call the backbone for nucleic acids. So if you were given an unknown molecule and you wanted to figure out what it was, you could search for phosphorus. It might give you a clue if it's a nucleic acid. But anybody know another molecule that comes from a cell from its membrane that has a lot of phosphorus? The phospholipids, right? So carbon, as we've seen, is the backbone. All organic matter has carbon as its backbone. It's present in all molecules. And this is why something that was once living, we can carbon date it. We know the decay rate of this element, and we can estimate how long ago that organism was once alive based on the decay rate of that element once the organism has died. We are said to be carbon-based life forms, right? Because carbon makes up the backbone of all our organic molecules, our carbohydrates, our proteins, our nucleic acids. Maybe somewhere else in the universe there might be something other than that, right? But um, as it stands so far, life is carbon-based. And then, of course, as we saw, Along with carbon, you're pretty much always going to have hydrogen and oxygen. Hence why water is so important. The electrons associated with these elements, because remember these elements are made of neutrons and protons and electrons. The electrons play a role in energy production and the synthesis of macromolecules. Because how does an amino acid hold on to another amino acid? They share electrons, right? A carbon binds with another carbon because it's, they're sharing electrons with each other. Right? They're covalently bonding. This is a pretty strong bond. They're sharing. Carbon is pretty good at sharing equally. Oxygen, not so much, right? Remember, oxygen is greedy. It tends to want to take more electrons than it's, than it's supposed to have. And then the poor little hydrogens are over there being positively charged because they lost their electron. They become polar, like bipolar, crazy. No, just kidding. So where do we get the other things we need? So where's nitrogen and, and phosphorus and sulfur, and how do they come into play? So they're important, right? Because we need nitrogen for the amino acids, we need phosphorus for the phospholipids and nucleic acids, we need sulfur for the two amino acids, cysteine and methionine. 
So sources of nitrogen, right? Um, you got your good old amino acid formula, and each amino acid, this R group will change depending on the amino acid, but you still got that carboxyl group and the amino group, and that's what joins one amino acid to the other. Uh, you got ammonia here, which again notices nitrogen with a whole bunch of hydrogen. You got nitrate and nitrite, which are nitrogen and oxygen, whether it be three oxygens or two. And thankfully, this isn't chemistry class, so you don't have to know the difference between the two. <laughs> and then, of course, we've already mentioned, right, some organisms, some bacteria specialize in this whole nitrogen um, movement and uh, assimilation. So they can change um, nitrogen into different forms, right? They can turn nitrate into nitrite by a similar nitrite reduction. Or is it nit? I can't remember which way it goes. Nit yeah, nitrate. It says both of them. But anyways, uh, the really important thing is that nitrogen in the atmosphere, in its gaseous form, cannot be used by mo most organisms. So the bacteria in the soil that convert nitrogen gas into uh, the organic forms of nitrogen that can be utilized by plants then eaten by animals is what cycles the nitrogen through the through the um, ecosystem. So they're very important. The unfortunate thing too is there are microorganisms that do the reverse that actually break nitrites and ammonia and nitrates into nitrogen gas and they are called denutrification right because they're removing nitrogen from the soil and putting it back in the atmosphere and as gaseous form. We don't like those guys so much. <laughs> we really are dependent on the ones that are going to put the nitrogen back in the soil and make it available to plants. Phosphorus, most organisms can use it in its inorganic form and directly incorporate it into the cells. For sulfur, most organisms use sulfate and again, we have organisms that um, convert sulfur into this form. And that's um, sulfur with four oxygens. So next time we'll start off by reviewing this table, right, and filling it in.